All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome again welcome to the Nefesh podcast. This is episode 58, and I have got with me my friend, Dr. Benjamin Kim, uh, who is a theologian, scholar, professor, and a brilliant, brilliant mind. Um, ben, where did you go to school again? Where did you get your doctorate? Uh, yeah, so thanks for having me on. Uh, I did my doctorate uh, at the University of Aberdeen. That's in uh, Scotland. Uh, but okay. I did most of my research uh, here in California. Uh, okay. I think a lot of uh, PhD research uh, is just, for me, looking at books, researching, finding more books. And, you know, you could do that anywhere. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> Especially with the UK, their system is really all about the research and then just kind of, um, you know, checking in with your advisor, making sure that you're not totally off track. It's a different system here in the, the, the United States where you you may go to classes, you may have like actual work that you're doing, uh, but the UK is much more research, research, um, research, research, and a lot of research. Did you actually then go to ever go to the school itself? Uh, I did. I was able okay. to go for several weeks okay. uh, and really participate as you know a full student. Um, there's definitely opportunities for uh, engaging discussion, classroom time, uh, but really those are I think self guided, self motivated. That right. you're not required, and so it really takes uh, effort on my part or you know the students part to have those conversations have those discussions um, but I think doing that makes uh, your theology and your research a lot richer deeper mm. and uh, you get to explore areas that you might not have considered just sitting in your own bubble right that's very important and the idea of kind of an echo chamber or our own bubble where we are just thinking and communicating and writing and reading, but we don't have alternative points of view or even points of view that expand our understanding of the topic. So it may, it doesn't even have to be somebody who disagrees with you, but somebody who shares something in a way that you hadn't thought about before. Did you have a lot of those experiences? Uh so again, because I was doing most of my research uh, away from the campus, uh, I didn't have much opportunities for that. But that does bring me back to uh, my time when I was at Boston University. This is uh, before my PhD. Um, my background, I'm coming, I come from a uh, uh, evangelical background, um, particularly a Korean evangelical background. But, you know, with that term, there comes certain uh, theologies, certain beliefs, uh, certain convictions. Now, having gone to BU, a lot of those things uh, were challenged because mm. BU is not evangelical. Right. Uh, and in fact, even amongst non-evangelical schools, BU was particularly uh, more progressive than, you know, other schools. Uh, and so it drew students from, you know, a lot of different backgrounds. Some of the students in there weren't even Christian. Wow. But we're talking about, uh, we're talking about God, we're talking about theology, uh, we're talking about mission. And, right, it's in those settings that if you're not paying attention, you might assume that, you know, we're saying the same thing, mm. but we're not. Mm. And one of the temptations, I believe, is that it's easy for someone if you you know would disagree with them that whatever they believe oh that must not be biblical or that mm. must not be uh you know coming from god when in fact uh we're all in the process of trying to understand god from our uh you know our fallibility right and so theology is a process amongst fallible people mm. trying to understand an infallible God. Mm. Now, there's got to be some 
uh, gaps in our conversation. Right? And I think that has been what the history of theology has been. Why is not our theology today the same as 2000 years ago? Hmm. Some things are, some things are, uh, are consistent, but in other ways, uh, we see God differently. We see scripture differently. Even in the history of the United States, our theology has radically changed in a mm. lot of ways. And so I don't think those things happen without stepping out of that echo chamber, stepping out of your bubble mm. and listening to other perspectives. Uh, and you can either agree or disagree. Uh, that's not, you know, as a, as a professor, one of my goals is to not say, here's, uh, here's a set of beliefs take it, memorize it, and and then be on your way. But really, um, I think the goal of theology, the goal of teaching theology is to expose students to different ideas, different perspectives. Where does this come from? What is their background? Why do they think the way they do? And then chew on it. Is there any validity to it? What do you think? If not, then move along. But mm. if it does raise any questions, then you know, you should sit on that. You should, uh, why does that, um, you know, why does that trigger something for you uh, to think uh, or question mm. or whatnot? And so, yeah. So you, you have also served uh, in a pastoral role. Um, you even pursued uh, chaplaincy. You got your MDiv from, from BU, is that right? And uh, I did my MD, my MDiv at uh, Gordon Conwell. Oh, okay. So and... Gordon Conwell is also in Boston area. Okay. Uh, so those were the two kind of polar ends of my experience. Uh, okay. In my theological training. What What did you get at at BU? I was a Master of Sacred Theology, so it was a one okay. year advanced research uh, degree. Uh, a lot of a lot of um, students do it it's, it's called an stm at the thm equivalent a master of theology okay. and i find that a lot of phd students sometimes do that as a preparatory work for uh deeper research but particularly uh, if you've a, gotten if, if you've gotten sorry to interrupt if you've gotten an mdiv which is a professional ministry degree um it is typically divided equally divided in three parts biblical studies theology and then ministry it's not a total theology degree and so do you got your i'm assuming you got the 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 stm or the the uh, sacred theology degree after your mdiv would that be right yes okay. uh, i found that the mdiv degree uh different schools do it different ways uh gordon conwell particularly had a, a biblical languages focus uh, and so comparing to other schools, I've probably done more biblical exegesis than a typical MDiv student. Okay. But that also means that there were some uh, less classes in other right. areas, such as ethics, uh, mission, um, counseling, things mm. like that. And so it really depends on the school, uh, how right. they structure the program. But sure. that was my experience. So as a pastor and even, you know, pursuing chaplaincy at the time, how was that experience as your, as a theologian really, and, a, you know, at that point, really pursuing theology and this understanding of, as you, I like the way you put it, gaps in our theology or the fluidity, the really, the meant to be fluid nature of theology rather than a rigid a dogma that can be confining how how did that impact your ministry i'll say that starting off uh when i was doing my md i didn't really consider myself a theologian mm. um, i think my story has been one of uh, process of uh, journeying and searching uh, for my calling and so you're right when you say that you know i initially uh, went into seminary uh, to become a chaplain. Mm. In that process, though, 
uh, as I was exposed to theology and ethics and um, and uh, biblical studies, uh, exegesis, all these things, um, I realized that it wasn't seminary wasn't just about how to do ministry, but it was more about uh, how do we approach you know our thoughts of ministry. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, I guess, for example, I, I never got a class in uh, how to baptize someone, or mm-hmm. I never got a class in uh, how to, you know, do church finances, for mm-hmm. example. I mean, those might have been helpful, you know, actually, now that I think about it. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it was more about here's the the the, the backbone or the, the foundations or the structures of why do we do the things that we do? Hmm. I think oftentimes we can go and do ministry and not think about why do we do that? Well, is it is the answer, yeah, that's what we've always done. This is what works or this is what uh, I see in scripture, hmm. but why? What is the context in which uh, whatever you're doing came out of. What is the theology? What is the reasoning mm-hmm. for doing what you are doing? And oftentimes, when I started digging into that, into that question of the why, um, it didn't fully uh, answer the question. It may have partially, but it could have easily gone, well, that doesn't mean that we have to do it this way. Right. That doesn't mean that there's only one response or one answer uh, to what we are learning, what we mm-hmm. are uh, reading in scripture, what we are uh, taking from theology. It could almost go a different approach. It could, um, ministry could look very different. It all depends on uh, how you interpret uh, through our own experiences, mm. through our own context, right? You wouldn't do ministry uh, with children the same way you would with adults. Right. So you can't just apply one the- theology in every context although we have tried historically we have tried we have we have done ministry to all ages the same way we have done ministry to different ethnic groups the same way i mean the you know famous instances of catholic missionaries coming to the united states and trying to convert uh you know native indigenous peoples and um we've we've tried because of a rigid set of of doctrine and a a dogmatic view that our interpretation is the right interpretation and i have found and and i'd love to get your feedback on on this i have found that our hesitancy to to be open to different interpretations of of scripture or theology is really rooted in fear, a fear of losing our foundation, losing our faith, losing the, uh, you know, becoming our, our theology, becoming watered down. Uh, and I, I, historically, I feel like I see that through every generation, every generation is afraid that that we are losing the essence of our theology. And I, I wonder if we really are, or if the theology is just being in understa- understood and interpreted in different ways. What do you think? I think when I see myself uh, as I get older, uh, that kind of resonates with me that, mm. I don't. I don't want to change. Uh, I spent, you know, decades of my life uh, in this way and have my experience, experiences. I'm tired 
of change. Mm. I'm tired of, uh, um, you know, exposing myself to new things, uh, new whatever. Sure. Um, I think, I think one of the examples that comes to mind is I just, uh, I don't know, for some reason, I get tired of, not tired, let me start over. Uh, just an example from my own life. For some reason, I, I'm not so interested in watching new TV shows anymore. Mm. <laughs> I don't yeah. know why. Yeah. But uh, uh, there's comfort in going back to what is familiar. Yeah. And so the shows right. that I watched when I was in my you know, uh, teens and whatever, uh, I like to go back to them. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I've already watched them before. But I don't know. It, there's some sort of comfort to that. And I think it's the same thing with uh not just theology or not just uh you know church ministry or whatnot, but there is a certain comfort in what is familiar. Mm. I think the challenge with the the challenge with theology is on the flip side you wrestle with the question of you know is this are we right or wrong? Right. Are we accurately understanding God or are we not? Right. For me, as I studied theology, I realized that, yes, it's easy to stay within the familiar and just stay within those bounds. But sometimes I question, is this right? Is mm. this the best way to interpret scripture or mm. to do theology? Because as I have experienced ministry and um just observing the world some of those theologies do not work mm. in fact sometimes they can do more harm than good mm. and you have to ask yourself is that right is that what uh god ultimately wants mm. and for me if that answer is no It's not just a matter of, all right, then we'll do something else. But question first, why is this here in the first place? What is the context in which um, this theology came about? And then question it. Mm. And then see, how do we then apply uh, it to our context? You know, one of the one of the things that, um, and you, you, uh, your dissertation was recently, within the last year, published with uh, was it Brazos? Uh, uh, it was with uh, Fortress Fortress Academic. Fortress Academic, um, and what's the name of the book? Uh, the name of the book is "The God Who Is With Us: uh, Theology of Mission in the Doctrine of Revelation." You in your um, in your work and you did a lot of uh, study of of Bonhoeffer and Bonhoeffer's theology and in what was the other one it was in conversation also with um uh, with Karl Barth yes Karl Barth um which I would love to talk about probably in a in another future podcast um but you I believe you talk about you know the understanding of community and that theology, in particular, scripture, has to be understood within the community. And I can't remember which one. I, I feel like Bonhoeffer, uh, I, I know he emphasized community, but was it Bart who kind of emphasized the understanding of scripture or theology within community? That that, that is a key part of keeping our theology intact that and it's it's an aspect of you know post modernity that is really close to the early church and what we see in the church councils that as they're discussing the various theologies that they're going to agree on which would be orthodoxy right orthodoxy just means right doctrine that as they're trying to establish a foundation of theology that they're doing it in community they're doing it with uh, well, I mean, it would have been the men at that point, but they're doing it within the community to understand. It's not an isolated event 
of one person interpreting and one person saying, okay, that's it. That's right. Everybody, you know, we've decided. How important is that in, in our understanding of, of this very topic? How does that tie even to your, to your work? I think uh, Christianity, our faith, um, I don't know if this is too strong of a statement, but it really boils down to our community, uh, mm -hmm. the community of Christ, right? We are the body of Christ. When Jesus establishes his church, he establishes a community, mm -hmm. and that is what the disciples do. Um, uh, Karl Barth, I don't think there's any theologian in the 20th century more influential than he is, mm -hmm. and especially his... Uh, how many volumes is it? Uh, four volumes uh, called the Church Dogmatics. He called it the Church Dogmatics. Uh, dogmatics is you know, another word for theology. Right. Um, so basically, it's a it's a systematic theology text, but you know, he envisioned it envisioned it for the church mm. that theology is done in the context of church, mm. and not and we're not talking about some. Uh, organization or institution, but the church as the community, the body of Christ. And so, you know, a lot of people have emphasized this. The way I see it, a community is like, it's like a checks and balances, right? that I can have my thoughts, but if I'm just in my own thoughts, that's for me. And even if I stray in a direction, I wouldn't know because I'm just in my own bubble. Right. But if I'm being checked by the community, right, of the saints, people who we call brothers and sisters in Christ, right, mm -hmm. you know, some of that, some of what happens there is, you know, we can get pulled back to uh, the so-called orthodoxy, whatever mm -hmm. that is. Or we can be challenged to move beyond our uh, preconceptions, our, you know, our habits and our, you know, just kind of our complacency. And I think ultimately community, um, I say it boils down to community because that is a reflection of God himself mm -hmm. as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who exists in perfect community and as the body of Christ, as people who are created in God's image. We are relational beings. We are communal beings. And so we cannot understand ourselves apart from being in relationship to one another. Hmm. That concept is both simple and profound. And what I love about it is that it crosses all disciplines. So in psychology, sociology, history, theology, we see that thought as the essence of our lives and our humanity, right? So we'll talk about, you know, other people being a mirror to us, that they reflect back to us what we are thinking, feeling, and where we are struggling, that they help us to see what we cannot see as, as beings who are just looking outward. And we cannot fully know our actions, our, our, even our, the way that we are being perceived without that community around us to help us understand that. And, and yet that is, is within our biblical understanding of the triune God, of, of the very community that he establishes in the garden that you see throughout the Old Testament with the Israelites and then the development of Jesus and, and his disciples, which of course then forms the early church. How does that then relate to um, your emphasis and your focus on this concept of mission? What does that mean? What does that mean in light of this, this community? How does that, how does that connect us to that thought? Sure. When we talk about mission, I think our first thought is, what are we supposed to do? Hmm. And that question is tied to, well, what did Jesus come to do? And depending on where you're coming from, there are you know certain 
answers uh, or responses to that question. Uh, and we can look at Bible verses, uh, John 3, 16, for instance. Um, um, you know, it came so that we may have eternal life. Or other verses, you know, it came to you know, seek and save the lost. What does all that all those what, what does that all that mean? Um, and that has been interpreted in certain ways uh, throughout you know the history of Christian theology. But the more I dig into this subject, and the more I understand God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as a Trinity, as a relations between you know three persons, and then have this theology, this relational theology, the more I see what God has revealed is that God has come, Jesus has come to establish community with his people, right? Mm. And I think words matter, the way we um, the way we package things. Mm. And so what I'm saying, I don't think is anything new, right? Um, right. Go here. But uh, I want to take it a little further and say that, so Jesus' mission was to establish community or reestablish community mm. with creation. Mm. What does that mean for uh, everything else? The way I understand sin then is that sin is broken community. Mm. That, uh, well, we talk about uh, being estranged from God or being separated from God. Uh, what does that mean? I think that. Uh, we don't have that relationship. We don't have that uh, community with God. And then also that affects our community with each other. Mm. Right? Jesus says, love one another. But we don't have love for one another because that community is broken, because that relationship is broken. And I think part of uh, God's mission is the restoration of that community, not just uh, between us and God, yeah. but also between us and our neighbors right and so that's where um christ's command to love our neighbors as ourselves becomes mm. key it's just as important as loving god mm. uh, they are on par with one another that you cannot love god if you don't love your neighbor but god calls us to love our neighbors as much as we love god i love the way you phrase that and it's something that i have I think been been trying to voice for a while that that we words do matter and our starting point is often starting with how bad we are how sinful we are that Jesus came to die for our sins all of that is true right but then where do we go from there Okay, Jesus dies for our sins, so what? So we can go to heaven. Okay, so then we're waiting around on earth, waiting to waiting to get to heaven. There's this, there's this uh almost disconnect between that single action there of his death on the cross. Uh, and I've I've questioned or said this for years. I've asked this in classes I've taught, you know, if if Jesus' sole purpose was really to just save us from our sins. He could have come down on that day, died on the cross for our sins, and resurrected three days later, and everything would have been good, right? The fact that he is born and lives all of those years and teaching and training and in community, and John 1 even describes that, that Jesus made his, his dwelling, his his uh, tabernacle he tabernacled among us it it then it connects the the death and the resurrection and the atonement to a deeper reality it's deeper than just my ticket to heaven which is an unfortunate evangelical focus that jesus's death on the cross and my salvation is my ticket to heaven it's much deeper than that it is a restoration of community and a restoration of the Edenic ideal that Adam and Eve had with God in the garden. It is 
the coming full circle of the community with with him and with others that was broken, especially right away when Adam and Eve started blaming each other and there was immediately this broken wall. I think that's such a powerful way of describing it. So how does that relate then to our mission? What is our mission in light of that? I mean, I, I want to touch back on something you said about, you know, just, uh, you know, the current state of evangelicalism. Um, and I think you're right that when we think about, you know, what is the gospel? Uh, and we come from an evangelical background and focus. Um, the answer is rooted in a particular cultural context of mm. uh, Western and, you know, I think especially American individualism right. and exceptionalism. And so that becomes, so the gospel becomes me focused. Mm. How does this affect me? How do I, you know, get to heaven? How do right. I become saved? Now, there is, that goes, that is true to a certain extent. But if we don't go beyond that, if we don't consider the larger picture, of mm. how do we become saved? How do we uh, you know, stand in right relation to God, then there's a whole chunk of uh, our soteriology that is missing. Mm. Um, and this is why it is important to listen to other uh, voices other that are different from us, right? Because if we go beyond a Western frame of thought, uh, listen to, um, you know, voices from the global South, their approach is, uh, is different. Now, it, you know, even in the global south, there are different perspectives, Pentecostal, evangelical, uh, you know, Catholic, and all that. But, uh, you know, let's just stick with the evangelical perspective. Even amongst the uh, evangelicals from different uh, parts of the world, we are all shaped by our own context. Mm -hmm. Context is different. And we also have our own histories, American history. Right, goes through this particular you know, exceptionalism, this individualism. Uh, you can trace back to you know Western and modern thought. And it's just not the case for everyone. Does that mean that God speaks only, you know, to Americans? Mm -hmm. Right. So, if we believe that God speaks to everyone, we need to pay attention to what other people are saying, not just our own uh not just to what is familiar no that's that's really good and really important and i appreciate that that reference and again i think it comes back to just our um not ignorance but our our tendency to be myopic and only see from our culture and our lens and our time and um if we are from uh, United States or Western kind of countries, but particular United States, we have a different way of looking at theology than others. Than, like you said, the global South. That would be, you know, India, uh, Asia, um, uh, Latin and South America. It would be other parts of Africa. There would be other parts of the world that have their own understanding of of God. That that is that comes arises out of their culture and those differences are important because they really do shape what we emphasize America, the West, our individualistic nature, the rugged uh, uh, importance on individualism that has been the earmark of, of the United States for so many years. Uh, that's going to shape our theology. It's going to shape our understanding of church, even of the necessity of church or the, uh, again, the understanding of, of salvation. And so I think that's so important to recognize maybe where our culture can have some limitations, what is beyond our culture and our perspective, and what is perhaps another way of, of viewing this. So in light of all of that, what becomes our mission if if we reflect upon Jesus's mission, God's mission to to 
reestablish or redeem community with us? What what becomes our mission? So this has been an ongoing process uh, for me, uh, trying to define particularly what you know mission is, mm. and the language I've recently used is mission of presence. Mission of, of being mission of, of presence. Okay. Of being with uh, others. Yeah. Not just um, giving them a message, mm. you know, i.e. preaching the gospel or, you know, giving your testimony or whatnot, or, and not even conversion as it has been sometimes. But it goes beyond that to restore and share relationships with one another by being with them. The way that Jesus came to be with us, mm. right? The Gospel of John. He came and dwelt among us. Right. Not just, here's the Bible. Right. Or here's the message. Mm. But Jesus said, here I am. Mm. I'm here with you. And What's interesting to note is that, you know, even in the, in the Great Commission, when he says, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. And what does he say after that? He says, I'm with I am you. with you. Yes. So even in our ministry, we don't do that uh, without God's presence already mm. there. And I think part of our the mission is really not just connecting with God, but being present with other people and sharing that community, getting a glimpse of what, uh, you know, that holy community looks like as we anticipate it in uh, the resurrection. Mm. But even now, in our existence, in this day and age, in our present life, we can still experience God. Well, we should. But I think one of the challenges is that we prioritize one thing over another. And so that mm. relationship, you know, sometimes it comes secondary. I say, mm. you know, I, I gave you the message, right? If, if, um, if there's nothing, you know, if there's nothing else, then at least this is what you need to know. Mm. It's not that. It's about, uh, again, that restoring of community with one another, and I think that is a the harder task. Because that's an ongoing process. Yes. And in some ways, there really is no, we're done, right? There's no end. Right. Relationships just go until whenever. Mm. And so. I, I, I love that. And it, it, our tendency, again, and this may be a Western thing, but unfortunately, I think it's spreading globally is that relationship becomes a means to an end and the end is getting them to know or you know become saved not seeing that the relationship is the end the, the connection with each other and with god and that that happens in community um and that's such a biblical thought i mean even paul as he's connecting with people all over in his ministry he travels and this his ministry wasn't actually a huge evangelical uh, 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 evangelism success, as we would you know refer to it. He kept revisiting and revisiting and revisiting and writing letters because it was about the larger community and relationship and growing together and building one another. And with the hope of, I think that, as you said, the ongoing, there's no end. And even in eternity, there is the ongoing relationships that we have with one another and with God. And I just, I love the way you have phrased that. Ben, you are such a thoughtful, thoughtful theologian who has wrestled with these things. And especially in the context of some really amazing other theologians, Bonhoeffer and Bart, but in such a powerful way that is so crucial for today, for the modern believer in church and have framed it in such a way that is so easy to understand. And um, having known your ability to teach and communicate, um, it, this is 
this is such a profound thing. And I think you have come to this moment in time to be able to communicate these things that need to be shared. And so it's been a privilege having you on. And I'm already thinking about ways I'm going to have you back and probably add in a few others and really get a whole theological debate going. I'm just going to sit back and I'm just going to like, you know, maybe poke the bear or get, you know, add, throw out some questions, just let you guys go at it. Um, but such good, such good content. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your thoughts. Oh, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, these are conversations I love to have. Um, and, you know, definitely welcome talking with other voices as well, because I'm always learning and I'm always growing. And so, yeah, I'm excited to see what comes up. All right. Well, this has been the Nefesh Podcast, episode 58 with my friend, Dr. Ben Kim, Dr. Benjamin Kim, a theologian, scholar, his book, God with us is that right um the god who is with us the god who is with us uh by fortress press um i'm gonna link uh, uh, uh link his book there and the picture of his book for you to check out further um invite you to to dive into this stuff uh, but thanks for listening thanks for being a part and we'll talk to you next time